everybody. It's Jane Johnson with the Briar Hill Group at Remax Camosa. We are grooving it today. How are you, Andrew? <laughs> hey, good. How are you? Happy, happy Monday again. You were enjoying happy that I was just thinking how much I enjoy these. I look forward to them, except for the stress of putting the PowerPoint together. Other than that, it's good. Yeah. I sometimes stress about them and I sometimes don't. I mean, it's not like we are doing, I mean, in some ways, this this is all unscripted. It's it's mostly unprepared. We're just kind of chatting about things. So uh, sometimes I feel a little guilt around that, and I think we should really polish it up. And other times, I really do enjoy just um, chatting it out and uh, getting a weekly update and talking to a colleague about what's going on out there. So uh, speaking of which, I have re shared this to a little too early. Um, just wondering um, how your weekend went. Uh, good weekend. Good weekend, you asked. Um, pretty, I don't know. It was a little slower. It's getting a little slower out there. Um, I had um, I had a couple of meetings on Saturday about uh, some potential listings. Um, interesting conversations are being had, you know, around timing and what's going on in the market and, you know, whether even to sell at this time uh, or at all, um, or to get out of the market before, you know, before it crashes, which is a constant, you know, conversation that, that there's a there's a segment of the marketplace always thinking of that. Um, drove around and drove around, did a trip up to Duncan with my partner, and went for lunch and had a nice nice little getaway on Sunday. So it was nice to have a bit of a day off. So I coached uh, rowing all weekend. Okay. And uh, yesterday I was frozen. It was like uh, the the weather was like civil. Like it had multiple personalities. Before the show, folks, Jane was showing me these um, these little face warmers that she's looking at buying for rowing. Now I know why. <laughs> Buffs. They're not face warmers. <laughs> I don't know. They, 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 you know, they, they go around your neck and they come up and cover up your ears and mouth. And I don't know. I forget what you call those, but. Technical uh, gear. Technical gear. Yeah, they're buffs. Yeah, it was uh, actually it was really it made me miss teaching. Um, you know, just sitting around, just chatting with the kids and talking about teaching and the different uh, courses they're taking and what they want to do and all this stuff. And I just it was grade nine and ten, and they were just really nice kids. So it was Ope, and they did awesome. And our very last race, actually, uh, our boys quad won, and they were like, yeah, it yeah. was so nice. <laughs> and I, after I uh, launched these boats, every time um, I launched it, I said to them, do your best, have fun, and know I believe in you. <laughs> and they'd all smile. Right anyway. on. So, okay, so let's get down. So we're going to look at today's stats, and then we're going to discuss what's happening with uh, the, a government announcement regarding a uh, delay of, uh, I guess, final acceptance. So we'll I'll, I'll uh, bring up the verbiage about that. Right. But in the meantime, let's just let's get to the stats. Yep. Yeah. All righty. What can you see? I see the stats, the market watch. Okay. Oh, now I see the he said, she said, they said front page. Okay, awesome. All right, so I'll do the first two. You can do the rest. Okay. Okay, so new listings this past week is 138. Pending is 168. So I guess it depends on where you're looking, on whether or not the market is going fast or not. Um, price decreases at 19. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, sure. And then eight price increases, three back on market. Uh, 247 exchanged hands, uh, 22 expired. So even again, in this really tight inventory market, which we will get to, still there are some homes that go through a full listing contract and do not sell. So Don't there was of people. There was one listing, a brand new listing on Union that was priced at 1.499 and they reduced 100,000 and he went from no showings to a ton. 
Yeah. And he also went from um, like not having the landscaping done to finishing it off. And it made a huge difference. And they, I know that they got an offer on Sunday. Okay. Not multiples, but at least one offer. Actually, they did go into multiples. So, so sometimes it's a question of really like, uh, and probably they got over ask. I don't know. Well, you know, they previewed what they were probably thinking. And Jane, you can take off the bottom banner. Um, we've got the double banner happening. Oh, sorry. No more singing. <laughs> okay. There you go. So this okay. shows the this shows the sort of cycles in real estate over the last number of years back to October 2019. And as we always say, it tends to sort of um, dive down in the winter in the November, December months, uh, ramps up for spring. Normally, normally this curve would be more like watching waves on the ocean, fairly even, um, running up into the spring market, sort of a plateau and a bit of a drop in the summer, and then a rise, a small bump, like a second small wave following in the fall, and then back down again. What we have been seeing um, lately, and it's active listings here, is just going down and then not really much of a bump and now continuing to go down. We're almost under a thousand listings in all of greater Victoria. That's all the single family homes. That's all the condos. That's all the townhouses. This is souk to Sydney to, you know, the Malahat. Gulf um, Islands. Yeah, the Gulf Islands. What's, I think what's important to note here is that two years ago we were over 2,600. So there was choice and um, it was a, I would say it was a balanced market and now you'll see we'll get to the balanced markets uh, screen and now you'll see that we're definitely still in the seller's market. I could, um, be, I could be wrong here, Jane, but I, I seem to recall hearing our three year, our, sorry, our long term average is around 3,500 um, yeah. listings on average. So we are nothing. And the reason for that is because the list to sale ratio here is very high. So you could see um, two years ago, the new listings were around um, 900. We're still up around that, but our sales have also increased. So whereas normally they would be around 600, we're up around 800 um, sales. So uh, when, when you see the bar graph, and the line below it coming together, and that means the ratio is uh, in favor of sellers. Yeah, you can see that down below at the bottom of this graph, it shows the listings are the bars, the sales are the, the lines, and you know, in a, in a, they tend to sort of follow around each other a bit, but not, not always one-to-one. -one. And um, when on average the sales are, are less than the listings, you're gonna have uh, inventory going up. Why is this showing sales? This should show inventory going up, but our inventory has been going down. What am I missing here? The inventory is going down because the new listings are not high and the sales are still high. Like we're almost where we were last year. Where list to sale is almost one to one. Yeah. yeah. So that's why. And also, if you look, it says peak and bump and the peak refers to the list to sale ratio. So we had a peak in March of this year of uh, very quick sales. And then um, actually that bump should be in August. You'll see another bump in the next graph where we have the ratio. Um, this shows and, the ratio much better. Yeah. yeah. So the bottom, when we're at 30%, we're in a balanced market. And as we move up, we're in a seller's market. This is, this side graph is a little bit off, but um, it's showing that we really peaked in March. And that's because when you look here at the previous, you can see, that the list to sale ratio, we had a lot of sales happening and relatively few um, listings coming on the market. Yeah. And again, some listings, I guess one of the reasons why that doesn't add up completely is that doesn't show the expireds. So um, there are, there are still properties that expire as well that, that take the properties off market. Yeah. So. And so, so what that does is it affects the uh, average house price. So, Two years ago, the average house price was just over 900. This is also for greater Victoria, including the islands. And now we're up at 
million as the average. And, you know, last year we were talking about how we were hovering over just at a million. Once we went over a million, it's like, boom, there was a jump. Yeah, there was resistance, you know, I think there's psychological resistance plus the resistance of, um, we've talked about this before, but the fact that you need a higher down payment once you're over a million dollars because you can't insure through CMHC or Genworth. Um, but there's a, a psychological limit as well. So once we sort of surpass that, then um, then the floodgates opened again. You know, there was resistance getting there, um, but once it's passed, it's okay, this is done. Now we're on to the next, the next phase. What's the next peak level? And it's really interesting to see, you know, here in Victoria that the average house price is over 1.3 million. But it will be dependent on what area you're in. So average house price in you know Highlands may be different than what it is in Oak Bay. We're looking at the big picture here. And so if you if you want more information about what's happening in your area, talk to Andrew or me about it. Absolutely. So condos, remember last year we did our little study to see whether or not condos were actually depressed and uh we found that they were and mm -hmm. they had kind of evened out and then they took off uh at the beginning of this year and um they've really risen steadily over the past few months and i think that's because people are more comfortable with being closer together again yeah i mean you can see if you follow this graph sort of generally back to october 2019 that it was on a rise um through the last part of 2019 early 2020 then there was a dip in April, um, COVID dip. And then it kind of re came back, but it was suppressed. And then it's now really kind of getting back to where um, it probably should have been all throughout. Um, but be I think because of COVID, you know, condos tend to be a smaller living space. And I think people were feeling kind of cramped and needing to, you know, preferring to find a larger space. So condos were maybe not as quick to sell. Right. And so, uh, but townhouses have done extremely well. Yep. We can see uh, they've steadily increased since uh, January 2020 with uh, going from uh, 625 and now they're up at 850. And personally, I like townhouses because they give you a bit of green space. You're not, you know, over somebody or under somebody. So... Mm -hmm. I think they've come into alignment as well. I mean, this this is a really swiftly rising graph right now. Um, I would be surprised to see that continue to rise. And I'd love to hear your opinion on this, but I'd be surprised to see that continue to rise um, into the spring as dramatically. Uh, you know, if house prices continue to go up, it may follow. But it's um, you know, I feel like it's just filled the gap now in in the difference in price values. Well, and also when like there's always a ratio of houses to townhouses to condos, and uh, that that's because if you look at the price of a house, let's say at seven fifty, and you look at the price of a townhouse at seven fifty, the townhouse is actually more expensive because um, you have to pay the strata fee on top of it, so your gross debt service ratio is going to be too high or, or higher. So, uh, relatively speaking, townhouses are always going to be a certain percentage under homes. And we're seeing that here where, um, you know, single family homes are up at 1.3 condos are at 625 and town homes are at 850. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's look at um, year over year comparisons. You go ahead. Sure. So last, so it's showing average sale price. And this is a different number than we were saying over 1.3, but some of these um, calculations are run differently, I guess. October 2021, the average sale price was 1.246 million, almost 1.247 million. That's up from just over a million, 1 million and 16,800 last year. Um, units sold is, is down uh, from 394 last year to 264. And I would suggest that those numbers would be not down if we had more inventory. Uh, and then days to sell are also uh, down, down, that's a good way for sellers. The average days to sell is now 21 as opposed to 32 last year. 
Right. And uh, that says something interesting to me. So even though the, the units are down, I think that's because there's less inventory. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, Con, go ahead. I just want to talk about the average days to sell as well, because, you know, you and I both see this, that um, that's, that's the average days to sell. And I would say 90% of the properties are selling within, you know, 10 days almost. And then, or, or let's say 70 to 80% are selling within 10 days. And then the rest are taking longer. Those are the ones that were overpriced and are now sitting on market a long, long time. And that tail is creating the, the longer average. But, uh, you know, if you looked at the majority of properties and how quickly they sell, I'd say 80% of them are selling in under 10 days. So what's interesting is over time, um, I had a house that was listed and actually the market caught up with it. Yeah. So we were priced here. We were overpriced. And as uh, we had it on the market longer and longer, eventually it just sold. And I just told the sellers, if you want this price, just wait. But the thing is, if you're selling and then you're buying, it's relative. And yeah. so if you're selling here and buying here, uh, you know, the price of home homes relative to one another is going to be the same. But if you're selling here and you're um you're waiting for your price and then you're buying, you're still going to have an issue because the, uh, the buying is going to be more expensive as well. And, and actually I'm seeing this with um, clients right now who have been approached to sell a half duplex and uh, they don't have to move for a, a number of years. And right. I'm like, well, but we have to look at where the market's going. We have to guess that you are going to, that the market's going to go up. We have to guess that to protect you because mm -hmm. if you don't move in two years um, and they have any, any time to move between now and two years, if you don't move in two years, then uh, uh, if the market goes up, you're going to be out of luck. It's really I mean, interesting. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. Um, I have somewhere, let's see if I can find it maybe we'll circle back to this and I don't know if you want to do this, but I actually have a, a little video that illustrates um, the whole market cycle quite well. Um, okay. So I'll see if I can just do a quick um, share screen here. Hold on. I'll do, I'll do uh, let's do the stats and then we'll get back to it. Yeah, let's finish it. Yeah. Okay. So um, average price of condos went up from 496,701 to 628,59. And uh, that's so 120,000, 25,000. Units sold is down from 304 to 294. And the days to sell is also lower at 23 compared to 36. So we're mm -hmm. selling properties in two thirds of the time for $150,000 more. And townhomes. Uh, they've gone up from 635 to 851. Mm -hmm. uh, Unit sold is down 89 from 125, and the days to sell is 22 from 30. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty amazing, you know. Um, and you know, working with people uh, who, let's say, if we were working with someone in October 2020 and they saw a home that was, let's say, or a con townhouse that was 650,000, they would say, "Well, that's let's say it was an average." townhouse in the in the average area and it was 15,000 too much over what we felt the value was they would feel like oh, I shouldn't buy that it's too much money nowadays they would look at that same property and let's say they saw it for 825,000 um 25,000 under the average they'd be like that's a great deal and you know what's changed significantly is just that you know this is what you can buy for the money and interest rates are low for sure but and we get immersed in the marketplace. Yeah. And I think also if you, if you, what I tell people, if you think maybe you might be overpaying a little bit and the market's rising, or if you're going to be buying and holding over a long period of time, it's like buying stock in, you know, Yahoo 20 years ago versus, uh, you know, right at the end of its run. If you, if you think that it's going to keep going, it's okay. But if it's not going to keep going, then, then, uh, you're not making a good investment. So how long you're going to hold on to it is important because just statistically over time, the price is going to increase. Mm -hmm. it, it tends to be that the, 
if you look at all of the graphs that we always show you, you know, the prices go up over time. They, they sometimes plateau. Maybe there's a bit of a dip. But over the longer term average, they continue to go up. So locking in when you can afford to buy seems to be the winning strategy. Um, there will be times, just like mortgage brokers tell us, that on average, and you know, pretty much any time in history when you've there's there's very few times in history when it's been better for you to lock in your rates as opposed to go to uh, a variable rate. Uh, you, you know, most of the time you're going to do you do better by by going with um, uh, the variable, and most of the time you're going to do better even if you pay a little bit more. Not that we want to continue to see. Honestly, do we want to continue to see this market continue to rise? You know, 30% rise in year over year, that's a lot, but it did that in early 2000s as well, and then it comes down again. 30% um, back then of, you know, 250,000, 300,000, still felt like a lot of money. Uh, feels like a lot of money now, but money isn't worth as much as it used to be. So that's the key takeaway, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so the waterfront, um, they've done well. So they went from 1.4 million up to 1.9 mm -hmm. with 24 units sold, just two more than last year. And the days on market is significantly less, 41 compared to 114. Yeah, waterfront's really been taking off. Um, it's, a, it's almost a 25% rise in price. Uh, and waterfront is typically something that can be sits longer on market as you can see days to sell you know down to 41 but 41 from 114 is significant you know i like waterfront but it can be a bit cold in the winter yeah it can be yeah but you know you okay. look at the gap you look at the gap now in price between waterfront and an average home and it's not you know double for sure i can't easily find that stat so i'm not going to oh wait here we go there you go. So average 1.2 for a single family home and waterfront is 1.9. Right. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is the home price index. So this looks at an ideal home. And uh, in Victoria, the real estate board, uh, this is uh, the whole area. We're looking at uh, 805 for October 2020 and up to 1 million 21. And what I did actually when I was doing this, I was looking over last month as well. So these are increased about $5,000 over last month, but over the year it's 26.9%. You want to do mm -hmm. the core? Yeah. And it's, it's funny, you know, it's really frustrating for people trying to save up for their first home and they're watching prices go up faster than they can, they can save. Um, you know, and ultimately you're trying to save for your down payment, but it's a really frustrating thing to see that, you know, you save, you know, a thousand dollars in a month and housing prices have gone up by 5,000. You're just feeling a little bit behind the, the gun. It's a, it's a really frustrating time for a buyer, but you know what, keep going, keep trying, keep, keep building because things, markets change and things change. And as long as you uh, um, are diligent, you'll get there. So um, something to keep in mind. Okay. So the core region went from 880 last year to, uh, and this is for single family dwellings, to 1,103,000. That's also up 25.3%. Uh, so that's Victoria, Saanich East, West, uh, Esquimalt, and View Royal. Peninsula? Peninsula region was 880,600 last year, and it's now at 1.110. 400. That's a 26.1 percent change. So it's um, beating the core region slightly, and uh, that's that's interesting to see. But it's not a significant difference. What's interesting to me is the West Shore region, Jane. Like, there's a lot of inventory that comes up in the West Shore region. There's a lot of growth in the West Shore region, and you'd think that that would cause more, you know, that law of supply demand, more supply, perhaps less demand. But the West Shore has really been taking off. There's been a lot of um, big interest in moving out that way. And, and, uh, and, you know, prices are still lower out there, I guess. So maybe that's why there's more room for that, that larger bump in price. We went from a 693,600 on average to 888,400. 
So what's interesting though, is like relatively speaking, if you look at growth in both areas, so I've been showing a lot of properties, obviously all over. <laughs> and um, as people, I find people work on a price continuum. So what do I mean by that? Hmm. When somebody says they want to spend $800,000, Last year, we were looking in the core, and now we're looking more on the West Shore. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And because you've been priced out of that. Yeah. yeah. And now also, like, if you look at the strategy of the different communities, the West Shore, the, we're talking Colwood and Langford and Spook and View Royal. Machosen. Is there a And Machosen. Well, less so much chosen. I'm just meaning the the focus of those four municipalities is really being on density, increasing right. density, whereas the focus of uh, North Saanich has been new construction on still fairly large lots. So that's why the price is higher. There's also less chance for density in on the peninsula because we have a lot of um, you know agricultural land reserve and uh, more limited. Uh, development strategies. So, but it's the, the ALR and the larger lots that aren't really as subdividable um, means that the West Shore has more room for growth. Well, also the, it's what we were talking about last year with septic or last week with septic is right. the septic has enabled the subdivision to happen. The sewer coming in, into the West I mean Shore. The sewer. Yeah. yeah. The lack so, of septic. Yeah. Taking those larger properties that were on septic that couldn't support more density now with the sewer lines running past that can support higher density in townhouses and condos even so you're seeing a lot more growth in the west shore for sure and still lower prices so that's why there's room for a higher price percentage and i guess the lower prices as well um you were talking about you know listing a home and it was overpriced and the market kind of to catch up with it and i have a i'm going to try sharing this little video that i that i have i made this a few years ago uh, I was with a different brokerage at the time, but um, I'm just going to try sharing this. It was pretty, pretty quick. It's a one minute uh, illustration of how to sort of um, understand the market as it comes and goes. So let's see if we can hit play on this. And... Hi, this is Andrew Klein with Premier Homes Real Estate and welcome to the one minute market update. Today we're looking at the relationship between price and time on market. At any time, Properties are coming on market, at market value, above market value, and below market value. What's actually happening though, if you're looking at the inventory of listings, is there's going to be properties listing at market value selling relatively fast. Properties listing below market value selling very fast. Properties listing above market value selling relatively slow. So when we look at the current list of options available to any buyer, we're going to predominantly see mostly market value and above market value listings. Now, what happens in a rising market? Well, as the property values go up, we're gonna find that those overpriced listings are gonna be selling as well. And we're gonna find that the underpriced listings are gonna be very, very uncommon. Conversely, in a lowering market, we're gonna find properties that were priced appropriately sitting on market over time. Thanks, that's been your one minute market update. This is Andrew Plank. Anyway, it's a quick illustration of what happens in the different markets and, and why when you're looking at the inventory, it's, it's important to understand that there's, a, there's generally a larger proportion of properties that are maybe overpriced. But in a rising market like we have, those will eventually sell too. Maybe not a bad thing to jump on those in this time of multiple offers. Um, those are actually in this case, in this market, the low hanging fruit where you can go in and maybe find a seller that priced too high and maybe still is motivated to sell but hasn't had the advice from the realtor to make an adjustment. And perhaps you can swing in there and, and grab that one. Yeah, and so the strategy is, yeah, to go for the higher listing and, and offer less. Mm -hmm. I've, I've done that. Yeah. We were trying to do that last week before they did the $100,000 price reduction. <laughs> right, yeah. And, that's and then the, we missed you know, it. You see this hundred thousand dollar price reduction you go well i i would have paid more than that so why not bring that offer 
time. Yeah, and the thing is, when somebody overprices that the buyer, they give the buyer the buyer more power. So then you're able to um, put conditions in on your offer. So let's say you're looking at one point two five, and that's where uh, the hot market is. If you're looking at one point three or one point three five, you can actually negotiate down. That's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, and and perhaps even negotiate a building inspection or you know, some time for financing. <laughs> wow. Imagine that. So or, hey. or you can even go in if somebody has no, um, no deferred offers and write it off for the first day and get those things happen to me. Sometimes does happen. Yeah. Hey, let's talk about, um, there's the, you know, there's a lot of concern and obviously valid concern that buyers have that this market is really, really tough on them. And, there's a lot of people shooting from the hip, buying homes without maybe doing a lot of due diligence. Um, for example, they may not have time to do a building inspection or if they have had time to do a building inspection because the offer, the, the listing was listed a week ago, but they're looking at offers tomorrow. Um, they've had time to do a building inspection, but they've had, um, they've been bitten before where they've done a building inspection and competed against 10 or 20 offers um, and that money is gone. So how many times are you going to do a pre-inspection before you say, you know what, um, I, I'm just going to throw an offer at this place. Uh, and it, it's been, there's, a, there's an interesting journey that clients seem to go through of um, hoping and expecting they're going to get a property at a certain price point, uh, be able to negotiate certain conditions. And they go through, fail, not failure, but not, not winning a number of times and winning out, losing to unconditional offers over and over again before they say, well, I, I guess I've got to, I've got to step up or, or step out. Here's so, the problem I find is that yeah. the beginning people feel like they're going to overpay because they yeah. haven't been exposed to the market before. And they go, well, if it's listed at 750, I think I'm, I'll, you know, I'll offer 760. And, and I'm like, well, it really is dependent on how many people are offering. So that's why we wait till the very last minute before we submit our offer, because, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you can have a listing and you don't get, more than one offer. So you wait, so you don't overpay and you pay um, list price. You could even pay slightly less, but if you're, uh, if you have five offers, I can guarantee you going in 10 or $20,000 probably won't get you the place over asking. No. And you do want to look at what else is sold in the neighborhood. And also, you know, like that video just sort of illustrated, if it's a rising market, you, you can look to the past, but you also have to project into the future. Um, you know, where are things going? And, uh, and, and, and and the other thing is that if you, uh, here's a mentality of a, a buyer, that if you offer and you get it, you've overpaid. Yeah. <laughs> no, you don't know. And, and, and you'll never know. And that's a frustrating thing. So let's talk about this. The, the provincial government, there's not a lot of details yet. You've got something to say there. No, I'm going to show you what they, um, uh, what was right. released. Okay. So the provincial government has announced that come spring, they will be bringing out legislation that will give a cooling off period for buyers. And I guess the idea, and again, with the lack of detail, clear detail, it's hard to know exactly what this will do. But uh, Jane, do you want to read this? Sure. Or a lot of Today, the BC government announced its intent to in introduce legislation requiring cooling off periods for real estate transactions involving residential resale and newly built homes. This change is expected to be similar to the cooling off period in place for pre-construction, which is seven days, uh, condominium sales, and will be introduced in spring 2022. It should say strata because it's strata, not condominium sales. Uh, we are disappointed. This is from the BC Real Estate Association. We are disappointed that this decision was made prior to a broad consultation with industry stakeholders and experts. We believe policies addressing market conditions should consider the interests of all parties in a transaction changing market trends, given consideration to regional impacts, potential unintended consequences, and should also include a defined process to monitor efficacy of the measures introduced. Without these details, it's not clear what has been announced will improve home buyer protection. BC's real estate regulator, the BC Financial Services Authority, will soon begin consultation on the appropriate length of a cooling off period. So it's not a choice. It's going to happen. And whether right. to include penalties for exercising the right to rescission. 
BCFSA will also be seeking input on additional policies such as restricting blind bidding, price baiting, unconditional offers, uh, mandatory home inspections, waiving conditions, and other practices that may be identified as consumer protection risks. So price baiting would be where you deliberately list low. Right. Market, market conditions over the past year have uh, left many British Columbians unsuccessful and frustrated when trying to purchase a home. We have conducted research on mandatory cooling off periods as well as other potential government interventions. We will be sharing our research with the BCFSA and with realtors. We have also begun to engage with media on this topic to ensure the public and government are aware of any pitfalls relating to this process. We will continue to meet regularly with the BF BCFSA, senior staff advocating for the government to undertake fulsome and meaningful consultation with real estate professionals professionals, and the public prior to announcing policies, especially when they are previously untested in Canada. We are also meeting and uh, requesting a meeting with the Minister of Finance. And I just want to say that um, this is a, a problem. This market is a problem that's not unique to British Columbia. And I have a problem with it. You have a problem with them having a problem with, sorry, what's your problem? <laughs> My problem is I think that they haven't really thought it through. Um, I think that, that, uh, did you just text me? Hmm? Oh, you just texted me. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. Um, the problem is, is they think that they're protecting the buyer by doing this, but what happens is say you list a home and you're a seller and, uh, you know, we negotiate the price with the seller. We show them the stats and they price the home accordingly. We give them different strategies and what we think might work. And sometimes it doesn't work. I've seen properties listed and they go, we're looking at offers next Monday and no offers come in. I mean, it happens. And uh, some people are still, when you talk to them, they want to list high and they want to negotiate down. Um, that happened a, a few times last year with me and I've, I've got a listing right now. People will choose what makes sense for them. Price baiting, price baiting is hard to quantify. Um, it's, you know, we'll sometimes see properties listed or we will list a property that in good faith we expect that we're even, you know, maybe at the top of the price point and um, had even suggested maybe, uh, you know, the seller has said, I, I want to try for this price, you know, let's see what happens. And yet you still receive multiple offers well above asking because the market just really took to that home for some reason or there just happened to be that. You'll have the opposite as well where, you know, um, there, there's, there are definitely, I've experienced definitely properties where it's really clearly underpriced and designed to create a bunch of churn. And that's frustrating for my colleagues and myself highly because nobody wants to be taking, you know, three sets of clients through a property that they're all assuming is um, possible to buy for 700000 for this beautiful house in Gordon Head when, you know, it's clearly going to go up above a million. And uh, that's just creating a lot of work for everyone and a lot of false hope. So, you know, I can understand, I can understand the want or desire based on all the frustration out there of the government to make some change. But my big concern with this, this kind of change is that it always has unintended consequences and it tends to fix a problem based on the current existing marketplace. Yes. But in a different marketplace. And so imagine if you have a cooling off period. Now, the only thing we really can relate this to is the cooling off period that we currently exists if you buy new construction. So if you're buying a new construction home, uh, sorry, through a developer that is, uh, you know, under construction, it's a, let's say a condominium complex or something like that. You're, you receive them, they've maybe broken ground, but you don't have anything really to look at. You've gone into a sales department or sales, uh, uh, you know, sales room and the salesperson is, you know, you sign something up on the dotted line. The government has instituted a seven day cooling off period for that. And that makes a lot of sense. You don't know what you're buying. Um, and you, you know, you could have been talked into something, you may have bought it without representation. You could have been talked into something that maybe just really doesn't work for you. Or you didn't understand, or you, could get yourself in some financial trouble by having to close on something 
two or three years from now and not have the proper financing in place. Well, the uh, other thing is like a buyer, one of the, so I, I brought this up um, between uh, us and other BC realtors. And one of them said, one of the issues is that buyers can offer on a number, may offer on a number of properties at the same time. Yeah. And then they may say, okay, well, I'm offering on five properties and I have a week really to decide. So I'm going to tie them all up and then I'm going to decide which one. So I think, that, so one of the in unintended consequences that's going to happen is I think as a result, because if that happens, you're not supposed to do that because you should have intent to purchase. And if you're offering on five properties, and we don't know, you know, who, what the uh, conduct is of other realtors or buyers. But I know that I would tell my clients, sorry, you can't, I will not write you an offer on more than one property at a time. I have been asked. Right. But so I think what will happen, an unintended consequence will be that there will be a non-refundable deposit. That was definitely something, I, you, you know, you and I didn't, we didn't talk about this beforehand, but that's, that was definitely something I was thinking about as well as, um, you know, we'll probably be seeing buyers offering, um, if they're really competitive, they might be offering a um, non-refundable deposit. And then it might be that sellers are requesting a non-refundable deposit. That being said, probably the legislation would address that. I would expect um, is, 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 this is the challenge with drafting some sort of legislation like this is it needs to anticipate and cover a lot of different bases. And when it does that, and again, it's based on this current marketplace, it needs to also anticipate what happens when there's a cooling off period for buyers when we're in a, in a, in a buyer's market and buyers, you know, these poor sellers who've been sitting there th for three, four months um, and finally have somebody come to the table and say, I'll, I'll, I'll buy your place. And, um, and they're, they're now they're tied to that person to sell to them. This is how real estate works in, in, in BC is once the seller has accepted an offer to sell, unless there's a condition for their own benefit, the seller is legally bound to sell to the buyer provided they remove their conditions. So if 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 you accept that, can, that offer and there's a, a cooling off period, let's say it's a week, uh, what if another buyer comes along in the meantime and would have bought it? Um, this poor seller has been waiting quite a long time now. They've got two buyers. Great. But the second buyer can't buy it. First buyer disappears a week later. That second buyer in the meantime has bought something else. Um, it's, it's, there's a, it's going to be really, really rough. Well, what I think what will happen is people will, buyers will start to have to prioritize more. And um, they may have to have backup offers in place in different places. I find backup offers tend to push an offer through the first offer through, but yeah. uh, it will, but then they will also have a rescission period. Like I just, one thing I really like about our system, especially when I compare it to my cousin's uh, real estate happening in Britain is that they have a lot of um, uncertainty around purchasing and selling. And I, I love the certainty that we have that if somebody says they're going to buy, they put in a deposit, boom, mm -hmm. you're done. In, in Great Britain, and there was just an article posted on one of our, our social network feeds about this, actually. But in Great Britain, it's very different than in BC. And of course, as you alluded to, a buyer could make an offer. Let's say you're renting. You can make an offer on a place. Uh, close in three months. You remove all your conditions. The seller accepts your offer. And a week before closing, the seller says, I've changed my mind. Apparently that's okay, you know, and meanwhile, you uh, what do you do with all the movers you've lined up or not? Like, do you have to wait till very, very, very last minute? Nothing's done until the money's changed hands. So, right. Um, we have a great system here. Don't get me wrong. It's, and uh, much better than some others because clarity is what we need to do to do business and for people to change, change, change hands and ownership. And we follow contract law. Um, question just is really how do we create equity and fairness for everybody um, i don't know that a cooling off period is going to solve the problem there's probably other tools that could be pulled out i also i also think that for sellers it will prevent them from moving on to the next uh step um so in britain actually what happens is once the contracts go to lawyers then it's considered firm 
I asked my cousin because I didn't really understand the system. But okay. but what we follow here is called the Torin system. Anyway, so um, once for a seller in order to purchase another property, they're going to have to wait a week as well before they decide to move forward. So they may lose out. So then what happens? Do they then go after the buyers for damages because the buyer decided not to move forward? Right. We have a lot of um, time clauses when you've got an offer, you know, you, you might be making an offer on a house and say, well, I'm going to buy your house if I can sell my house. And uh, that seller of that home can, um, well, can accept that offer. And generally there's an, they'll accept it with a stipulation that they, um, they can come back to you and say, you've got to, you've got to buy it regardless of having your home sold because I've got a, I've got another buyer here who's unconditionally agreed to buy my home. And if that situation comes up, then they can come back to the first buyer and say, okay, you know, either remove this condition to sell your home or step away so I can work with the first buyer. But when there's a, a cooling off period, that's going to really um, cause a lot of damage to that system as well. It's going to have to adapt. You're going to have to have the cooling off period for at least a week before they decide. Also, I'm thinking that maybe some people may say that we're going to, there's going to be languaging around people revoking that, right? Mm -hmm. Even though the, legislatively they shouldn't be able to, I can see that somebody will say, well, I want to make my, like the whole thing is everyone wants to make their offer stronger than everybody else. So how are they going to do that? Yeah, I th so what we're talking about here is, is that um, even just like people, you know, pay their taxes, people are always looking for loopholes um, so that they want to be able to, you know, um, not have to pay as much tax as they have to. And when a new regulation comes into place, people look for the loopholes in that regulation and, and, and they maximize those loopholes. They, they find a way around it, perhaps we are going to see probably a lot of that and it will create uncertainty in the market, which will, um, which will cause the market to falter if that really comes about because uncertainty causes, it causes people to hold back. It causes uncertainty. Uncertainty causes uncertainty. This, this, <laughs> which that's not what we're, it's with the uncertainty, uh, People are going to have a harder time making decisions. They're going to have a harder time uh, making that uh, firm and binding contract. And with that, we're going to see probably intended effect, which is a cooling in the market. But that intended effect could be harder and faster and stronger than uh, than is anticipated and will cause more harm than good, is I my think, thought. I think that all these policymakers need to go through empathy training. Empathy training meaning they need to sell their house and then let me know what you think really about this, how the system works, because right now what we're experiencing is a result of, um, I think, uh, you know, a global phenomenon. <laughs> it's not just local. It's not BC. It's all over the world. It's all over the U S it's in Europe it's crazy. And it, people have been responding to a pandemic. Mm -hmm. So to create legislation, to change the fundamental way that our real estate system works, which, and it works so well because uh, they want to slow the system down. You can't slow a global pandemic down. You can't slow fear down. Right. Yeah. Anyway, but I do, what I see is buyers are going to be like, well, okay, so I have an extra week, but you know, now all of a sudden I have my choice of properties that I can offer on. Like if it's offer Monday, you know, over the next week, I can really decide more if I want. And are they going to be doing more investigations? Maybe. I mean, a lot yeah, of right. people. On offer Monday, instead of making an offer on one property, hmm. um, an unconditional offer other than this rescission period. Um they they may make five offers because they can rescind four of those if and so they can roll the dice a little more easily and do you think that's going to bring prices up because you're going to see instead of five offers on a property you're going to see 45 offers on a property 
because now everyone will be prepared to buy everything instead of making a choice around one or the other. Yeah. So the, whole, the whole idea is here, I think I've got no problem with tweaking um, the system and trying to improve it. Uh, I think it's a matter of really, really clearly looking at all the potential, um, well, you know, again, the loopholes, the potential uh, fallout, and also um, think about what happens in future markets as well, because any legislation or any change you do to the marketplace should apply across all future scenarios, not just try to fix a problem that's one existing right now today and may not exist even come spring. Yeah. And the thing is, is that markets are cyclical. We have been through a few since we've been in yeah. business for 15 years and we've seen yeah. the market go down and I'm seeing, I'm sensing right now what uh, with my buyers is they're asking way more questions than they were a year ago. It's not as easy. And so just to assume that it's going to continue on a pace, it's not, it's not. And so there's going to be a shift again and the market will even out. We've seen that. Yeah. Now, so and if it shifts in conjunction, like independently of the legislation, the legislation is applied at the same time, it will dramatically um, impact the marketplace. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to hope and trust that the government um, can take all that into account. But um, that might be a little naive to think. When when I worked in government, we had a, I was a. Um, provincial employee and working at the ministry of education and we had a new government came come in and uh i remember they were coming up with all these ideas what do you think i was working in education technology let's give everybody a computer let's do this let's do that and i'm like you know we researched many of these things anyway we had to go and research them all again and and i thought really they're just picking without a lot of thought this is sexy. Yeah. Oh, well, that, that is the point. I mean, government doesn't stay in power unless they are able to provide the sort of the key points to the people that they're, you know, touching on the pain points, I guess. And uh, right now, this is a pain point that's very clear. And if they can create some legislation to say, I, we're doing something about this, then they get to look like a hero. But unfortunately, you know, governments come and go and, you know, we're, we're all going to have to live with this legislation. Legislation tends to come in and then it's kind of hard to get rid of. We're, 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 you know, realtors, I mean, you know, smallest violin, nobody's going to really feel bad for us realtors. But, you know, we're dealing with a lot more paperwork than ever we did before in terms of um, disclosures and uh, protectionism. And also, you know, almost I'd call it invasions of our clients' privacy because, you know, we are asked by our federal government to, um, you know, double, double check ID, that's fine, to um, determine if they are politically exposed in any way, to um, ask for all, you know, a number of banking details for the money that's coming in. And um, we're, we're, we're supposed to um, not just wear our realtor hat here, but we're supposed to be an adjudicator of this information, a collector of this information, uh, large fines if we don't do it correctly. Uh, and, and, we're, and, we oh, have and of course, reporting reporting uh, commission to our sellers when there's a uh, when there's an offer, even if there's 20 offers, we have to uh, report out the commission payable for every single offer. Um, and, and, and we can't just do it on one sheet. We can't do it in a spreadsheet. We we kill a tree for every transaction. Yeah, yeah. it takes it 20 takes pieces hours. of paper sometimes. Yeah. And the whole reason for that is because the uh, they want us, they want the sellers to be able to think over. And the, what I found is the sellers are like, why are you disclosing this to me? We already negotiated it in the listing. I'm like, I know. I think I'm, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not opposed to a disclosure if something differs from the listing contract. But when you're talking about, you know, here's the commission payable on this offer for a million dollars. And here's this other commission payable for this offer for a million dollars and this other one. And by the way, and, and meanwhile, you've got an offer that's open for two hours to discuss with your clients. And before you can do that, you have to say to your clients, OK, but before we can look at this offer, we need to go through all this paperwork. And and the seller is just saying, well, I don't care. Just let's move on. Yeah. So I, it, I'll, I'll, the, the, point, other the point is, though, that, you know, we're inundated with a lot of uh, a lot of friction already 
Yep. And a lot of it seems unnecessary. And once it comes into place, it doesn't get fixed or changed because the legislation's already come and gone and the, the, the politicians have forgotten about it. Um, and it would be great if there was some streamlining of all of this. So again, I don't have a problem with these kind of things as long as they, they make sense and they're smart and they, they have an effect. But I feel like a lot of times this reporting that we do isn't really going anywhere. So, sorry, rant over. You know, I was like, is this a discussion or is this Andrew's rant? <laughs> I like how real estate's really changed in 15 years, you know, and we've seen agency change. We aren't allowed to represent both sides, which is okay. We've yeah. had to develop relationships with other realtors and maybe spread the love a bit. It's actually cost, I think, people money because before you know, maybe we could have made a transaction come together more easily. And now um, we can't uh, because we have to um, uh, allow the seller or buyer another uh, representative to come in. So that costs the seller money. And then there's less rig wiggle room. And, you know, then we have the agency. We went used to go from corporation agency, like under our brokerage, where we all at Pemberton Homes, there wasn't an advantage to work at Pemberton Homes like we did because there were 200 agents. And so we had to disclose dual agency. And then we went to designated agency and now like no agency. <laughs> and it's just been interesting because uh, uh, people don't realize how regulated we, we are. When I went from teaching to real estate, I realized, oh my God, I felt like I was being flayed. If I did one thing wrong, I would like, fine, fine, fine. You know, if an advertiser didn't put my logo in, <laughs> which happened in um, a newspaper, I got fined $2,000 over the course of a year. And, and somebody was watching and just pointing it out every time so that I would keep getting fined. And I was talking to the advertiser and telling them, you know, like it was like people were, I felt like people were out to get me, but I'm, I'm venting too. I just find like the system works well. Yes. It's too fast right now. And I can yeah. tell you there's realtor fatigue. There's buyer fatigue. Yeah, yeah. I don't think there's seller fatigue, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's going to change because the buyers aren't playing the game anymore. So just let, let nature take care of itself. Yeah, yeah. Things find their balance. And when you try to adjust it, you, you, you will have unintended consequences. So that's the one thing I've seen. And you know, the issues of today are forgotten tomorrow. This market will change. Uh, it's actually probably on the cusp of changing, I would say come spring, but uh, we'll see. Yeah, I, and I think truly the victim here is going to be the buyer again because they're going to be doing non-refundable deposits for that week. I think buyers and sellers will both be impacted and, and there will be people who will who will win. There will be gaps and niches where there's advantage to be taken through following the rules or um, utilizing those rules where uh, other people may not. Uh, but again, it remains to be seen. You you know we'll all you know we're all going to be thinking about how we can both you know how we can best serve our clients under a new set of rules when those rules come out, and yeah. um, and and at the same time our our goal our our role is to follow our clients' lawful instructions, and if a client instructs us to do something legal that we may not believe is moral, um, we've we've got a working relationship with these people. Uh, if it falls into the realms realm of legal, we are, are bound to do that, um, you know, unless we choose to sever that working relationship, which can't always be done at the, you know, 11th hour uh, without causing our own, you know, set of complaints around us not providing agency to a client. Yeah. So um, it's going to be interesting times. It always is interesting times, isn't it, Jane? And one of the things about that we both love and find frustrating about this, this business is that it's, it's constantly evolving and changing. It's a people business. It has nothing to do with real estate, really. It's about managing people and their expectations. And anybody who thinks that it's about us, like trying to artificially raise the price of homes, 
I mean, really, we're just doing trying to do the best for our clients, either on the buying and the selling side and, and by working both sides of the market. You see both. You cannot be insensitive to both sides. Otherwise, yeah. you can't be successful. No, absolutely. And in fact, the best transactions are the ones where, you know, you're working with a seller. Let's say in this marketplace, you're working with a seller and you can, um, the seller, you can help the seller understand what the buyers are going through. Um, the sellers can make choices that maybe, um, you know, help all the buyers feel better, even at those that lose. Um, you know, you, by providing additional information, by by being good at communicating with your, your colleagues and, and, and those colleagues who are working with those really frustrated buyers. Um, it's that lack of information that causes the most pain for people quite often. Um, yeah. So, you know, yeah, the empathy is a big piece. Okay. So we have reached an hour. God, Probably our good. longest show. Um, how do people get in touch with you, Andrew? They can reach me uh, by calling me or texting me at 250 360-6106. You can email me info at andrewplank.com or check out my website, andrewplank.com. And Jane, how would people reach you? Well, they would reach out and touch me through briarhillgroup at gmail.com. Uh, my number is 250-744-0775. And you can reach me on one of my two websites, briarhillgroup.com or vancouverislandtime.com. And you can subscribe to our monthly newsletter and we're going to put this in there this month. Nice. Okay. Well, thanks. Right. Jim. Always good to chat. Always fun. Yes. Next week, we're going to have Yvonne Landstra. She's an award-winning um, uh, stager. And uh, she's going to be talking to us from Calgary. So uh, she visits Victoria often. And so I asked her if she would be kind enough to be our guest on our show. So she's going to be uh, chatting to us about what's happening in staging. Woohoo! Okay. Maybe we can get some tips on setting up our homes. Yeah. All right, everybody have a great day and a great week. We'll see you next Monday. As always, if you're watching us on YouTube, please don't forget to subscribe. Woohoo! Excellent. <laughs> All right. Have a good week. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, everybody, for watching. See you, see you next week.